the kids be over here too. They like to, since they're shorter than me. <laughs> Not really, some of them. <laughs> right about there. Okay, Harold. All right. All right, baby. Folks, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. We're here in Long Beach, California at the church where my next guest, uh, was one of the, his family was one of the first uh, families. African-American families, so you can say it like it is. Harold, <laughs> Harold Brown, what an honor, man. Welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show, brother. Well, thank you for coming out to check on us to see what's going down. You want to keep playing? You want to play another groove at all? Oh, let's see. Yeah. What's another one we like to play? You know, there's a lot of stuff. I was always wondering why down in New Orleans, yeah. why they loved our group. And when I moved to New Orleans, which I still got a place down there, they had that certain thing. I like playing this. I like going to put a little cloud here. That's that second line kind of feel. And here's another one, too. This was something we used to always play in the South LA, you know, in the blues clubs and stuff. Over at Jeffy's, Cocktail of Big Mama Thornton. Oh, yeah. And, you know, there was a shuffle, it called a double shuffle. And this is the groove that I was playing the last time uh, I jammed with Jimi Hendrix. And Jimi was standing over my left shoulder right here, talking in his ear. And I could see his hands over here. And I was doing this groove. But something I found out is that a lot of that ties right into a lot of African music. Because I started messing with doing like a shuffle. These are not the symbols I play on all the time. Mm -hmm. By the way, Sabian gave me an endorsement, and Sabian is uh, tied into Zildjian. And I met Bill Zildjian. Yeah. And they told me, you know, that the machine is making. So by me being a former machinist, then uh, I had to go with him. I like to like That's what I love. Another thing that was always, we played a lot in the blues clubs was, a, a, you know, we call it a, uh, yeah. a, you know, sort of like a, what was it over there? Thank you. 
funny story. Oh, man. Yeah, I mean, you're not even letting me ask questions. I love Harold <laughs> Brown, man. Now, you know, I do want you to t- just talk to the audience about, um, because the clave came in for you when you were sneaking down to Tijuana. And oh, I want, yeah. I want you to talk about going down there as a boy. And, okay. and what I mean, you said it all ties together. It all ties together. So tie in the, 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 how, okay, the, how, the how, how the snake, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, like, when I was young, you know, around the blues clubs and stuff here in Long Beach, and I would hear all that stuff, woke up this morning, which is a bolero, I just played, and all this stuff. So my mother used to like to go hang out with her friends down in San Diego, and then they would go over to Tijuana, and they liked to go to the dog races. Hmm. Well, me, I've never been a gambler. I mean, I only gamble on me. I don't play slot machines. I uh, maybe played a, I can't lie, I played a couple of scratch tickets. And a couple of times I played, I won. Not a lot of money, but I won. Helped to, you know, buy lunch and stuff at school. <laughs> but, uh, but you gamble on yourself. Yeah, but I gamble on me. And so I started going over about, maybe I was about 15, 16, maybe 15 or so, hanging out in the clubs up and down there in Tijuana. By yourself? I mean, you, you... Yeah, I'd just go, you know, through the clubs. They would be off watching the racetracks and stuff. And that's a strange thing. See, Carlos Santana was down there about that same. We're about the same age. He was hanging out there. So anyway, oh, I started seeing the going into those clubs. And then I would see the dancers and stuff. And they loved this cowbell pattern. And so, you know, it was that feel that I would hear. Also, by being in Southern California, Long Beach and hanging out around San Pedro and Compton, Watts, you had all this integration of music where it ties in together. And so, you know, the clave, like, you know, one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, two, two. You have the three, two, and the two, three. Well, that started in Yoruba, Northern Africa. So when the Spanish and stuff started coming over, conquistadors in the 1500s, a lot of that music tied right in. It came on up through what? The Caribbean, Mexico, Cuba, Puerto Rico. So you started finding, because I started finding I could take that clave, and it fits with a lot of stuff that you play. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, it makes it, it tie together. The diaspora you're talking oh, about. Oh, the diaspora, yeah, yeah. right. So I found even with classical music, it could fit. Really? Right. The clave can fit into classic. Oh, yeah. I've got some that I've been writing and stuff. Let me ask you, you know, you're, you, I want you to talk about this. You, you wrote a uh, music for a play right. recently. Right, it's okay? called The Holy War. Okay, my question is, how much of that, you are a historian, you, you, you're a deep reader, but how much of it was situations where, did, did you see the screenplay first and then just feel it? How did you compose that music and explain the, 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 uh, the genesis of the, of, okay, of the well, play? Okay, uh, well, Rob Florence. Uh, live in New Orleans. He went to the University of New Orleans and so forth. And Bruce Sunpai Barnes, he's out on the road with uh, a lot of people, you know. Anyway, I had read this story about Captain Andre Caillou. The book is not here right now, but it was, uh, you know, the uh, Black Phalanx mm-hmm. by Joseph T. Wilson. It was written in 1869. I wish I had the book here. It's at the other place where my, all my other books are. They say you want to hide something, put it in a book. <laughs> Chinese also say you want to rule the masses, <laughs> keep them ignorant. <laughs> well, well, actually, I, I, we're going to go right up here because it's right, it's right here. Oh, oh, there it is. There it is. Ah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Now, this book right here really enlightened me. You might be able to find it. Now you'll find prints of it, but they've been photocopied and this right here is an incredible book because I like to read the hypertext when I went back to school one of my professors said the most important thing a lot of people miss is the preface right the preface yeah, right. The pre- you yeah, yeah. what you're gonna read what you're gonna learn out of it I still struggle reading the preface well I yeah. love it yeah and some of the things that I found that was beautiful out of this those black soldiers wasn't fighting for the money. They weren't fighting for the money. They were at the Battle of Port Hudson. I mean, they were at the Battle of York. Oh yeah, they've been around ever since the 19, it was 1770s. Here's one of the sayings I love that they said. 
They fought for the spirit of freedom. Wow. They didn't fight for money. They fought for the freedom of their kin. The swamp angels. Woo! <laughs> Some strong ones. The power of free people. Hello, America. Wake up. The power of free people. We got to keep that in mind. Marching under a flag of freedom. Oh, and if somebody told you no quarter, if all you had was a, an eraser or a pencil, you better fight because they ain't going to let you live. They're just going to take you out. Let me ask you, though. People are loving this, but, they, but, but when you composed this music, was it more about feel, like how you felt? Like how did you compose music for this, for, this, for this play? Well, what I did, I went back and Jordan Noble, he was a young black soldier, and he was at the Battle of New Orleans. It was it January 5th, 1815, if I'm not mistaken. It might have been January 3rd or so. But at the Battle of New Orleans with our seventh president, General Andrew Jackson. And he was just a youngster. And as they marched, it was the Jordan Noble role I learned. And I based it around this. It went. Jordan Noble, Noble role. <laughs> and then what I did, I took that role and sometimes might have changed the tempo to make it a dirge much slower. But I built all the music around that. One of them is called Don't Forget Me. And it was about, you know, he knew that they were, most of the soldiers that went up, they knew they was going to die. Because mm -hmm. back in those days, uh, those cannons didn't just have a big bomb or go boom. A lot of times they would have nails, horseshoes, chains. Anything they could find to pack in there. So when you marched up that hill, it was a good chance you wasn't coming back. And if you did, you was going to be maimed. Dirty bomb. Dirty, yeah, dirty yeah. bombs. And, and so that really uh, made me think. I said, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Okay. Think of how these men felt. And then along with uh, Sun Pie, uh, Rob Florence, a lot of uh, you know top musicians in New Orleans. Matter of fact, I got a copy of the CD over there. I can show you, you know, a picture of it later for you. But I just kind of like put myself as a person in there. That's why like right now, personally, when I look at all of our senators and our congressmen and stuff, they're a bunch of old people. They're gonna make decisions for young people. Come on now. Part of it is though, I mean, they don't want to leave the stage, right? So it's, it's imperative on younger people to know how to think. Yeah. And I'm curious about how you learned how to think well, for yourself, because, especially with Howard. In those days, when those cats would, you know, you were playing at that swing club. How did you guys learn to think for yourselves? How? Yeah. I've always been an independent thinker. <laughs> Me, for myself, I was older out of six. Hmm. Oldest out of six kids. There's five boys and one... No, but I think you're hitting on something important. You have a, a bunch of older cats making decisions for younger generations. So if you're talking to younger peeps out there, how do they think for themselves and not what to think? Because most curriculums now are based on what to think and not how to think. No, what we have to do, when we go in, the more you read, the more you learn. I started going in... Okay, case in point. When I was going to Lutheran High in 1960... Six right in my 1960, up to Los Angeles. I rebelled, you know, told him I wanted to come back to Long Beach, go to Long Beach Park. But when I went up there, I found out that I was one of, you know, a distance runner. And I was on the junior varsity, and I was only like 15. And all of a sudden, next time, they made me varsity. And I ran, ran with Gregory Peck's son, Tommy Peck. Gregory Peck. Well, I ran with Tommy Peck, and he used to show me, he was like about three years older than me. Mm. He used to always show me all the fancy track shoes, his Adidas and stuff, that his father would send back to him from Europe. And it was made out of kangaroo skin. It was really light, and it only had four spikes. Anyway, he graduated, and he went to go to USC. And when he got to USC, I'll never forget reading in the newspaper that he took a gun and blew his brains out. 
Now when you go read the story, they didn't change the whole story. Now it's some kind of thing, you know, it's just, you know, blah, 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 blah. They papered it over. They papered it over. And then when I heard that happen, you know, when I read that, I said to myself, Harold, if I ever become famous, I am not going to spoil my kids with things. Not with things. Because really he wanted the love of his father, Gregory Peck. Absolutely. He didn't want things. So then when I got, you know, started growing, I started thinking because I didn't play drums the way the music book, you know. You know, I got the music books. Uh, throw the books away, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had the books and stuff, you know. <laughs> and then I got in there, and you know, I started saying, well, but it got good after I started learning. You know, I started saying, oh, this is what I've been doing. Right. But I had my own style. Right, exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. why when you hear Slipping in the Darkness, or Why Can't We Be Friends, or Cisco Kid, or Lowrider, I, not just me, but Howard Scott, the guitar player that sings that. He was the main writer on that. B.B. Uh, uh, Dickerson, Morris B.B. Dickerson. Insane the same bass, bass player ever. You know, he played Lee Oscar, Charles Miller, that actually sang Low Rider. He went to school right down near the street of Long Beach Poly with about four or five blocks right there from there. <laughs> he lived a couple of blocks from there. Uh, uh, Papa D. Allen, Sylvester Allen. But he was East Coast cat. He was East Coast, but, but that's the difference. You know, like Tito Puente, I got a chance to jam with him. But, you know, we, but, but see, the thing is, you got to think outside the box. How did, how did, can you de- talk or even demonstrate to the audience how you taught Papa D the Afro Cuban rhythms, considering he was coming from more of a sort of an upper crust percussionist? Uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to teach him, like, I'd have to get over to my yeah, congas. Yeah, go over the congas, yeah. Joined here by a legend, Harold Brown. The dude broke his first gold <laughs> record because he didn't want to spoil his... He said, screw this. I didn't want to go to my head. You see, Papa D was very... Like uh, uh, Tito Puente and him. They played very sophisticated. But growing up here in Southern California, and, you know, like Mango Santa Maria. Right. Or, or, you know, some of the Cubano. It was more... We had, instead of playing all the flashy stuff, we would get the little grooves. Yeah, what was Papa? What was Papa D doing before you got your teeth into him? Uh, well, I found Papa D. I was living out in a little place called Pomona. Mm-hmm. That's about maybe forty miles from Long Beach, and I was in a gas station there on Gary Highway and Arrow Highway. And I was, he was, I went in there, and there was this man, this gentleman there, and there play, sitting down with a, a kung in his, you know, between his leg and a bongo playing at the same time. I said, Wow. He was having this oil change. He used, to ride, he used to drive Ramblers. Matter of fact, every time we went in front of uh, American, you know, the American uh, Motors at the time was Ramblers. He would make a stop, and Papa D would jump out of his car and he'd go over there and salute American Motors, <laughs> and he'd jump back in. But see, I had to teach him, you know, like what was he doing though when when you first? When I met yeah, him, yeah. He, what was he doing? He was just. Uh, I think, you know, he may have, you know, his father had a lot, his father was pretty well to do, back in Wilmington, Delaware. He had, uh, 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 he had his children. I met his daughter first before I met him, because she was working in, uh, you know, some city hall there in Pomona. But we, I didn't know that until later. Well, no, obviously, but, but I'm saying, like, like, what did you, how did you help him? Because you and Howard were growing up. In that area where there there was that crossover, yeah, that crossover. So I see him playing. I says, "Papa D, how would you like to be in a band with us?" <laughs> and at the time, I named the group the Night Shift because I'd been working in the steel yards. Right. I was a Class A machinist. I was making parts for the space, doing the shooting monkeys in the outer space, uh, doing Vietnam War. Forget you know, I, I had to make parts for the military. You know, parts for that ugly word, <laughs> but. Um, making parts. Because Papa D seen me, he come up there, he says, Harold, what does a young man like you do 
to own property like this, a house. And because I was working as a machinist, I was in the machinist union. Hey, I tell you what, I was, I've was i been a union member in the machinist union, a musician union, SAG and AFTRA, but I was making, like in the 70s, you know, 7, 1960, excuse me, 1965, 66, all in there, I was making four or $500 a week. Well, the, the, the unions were the, the strongest they ever were at that time, too. Exactly. So you, so, yeah, that was... So I'm making so I could afford, you know, earn a living for my family, you know, for my kids. You know, my first wife, uh, Doe, uh, Harold Ray Brown the se uh, second. Harold Ray Brown. Yeah, Harold Ray legend. Brown the second. Legend, legend. Yeah, and uh, Harold, uh, uh, Daryl Lewis Brown. I named him Daryl because I love them both. So I couldn't say Daryl and Harold. <laughs> And Janice, <laughs> Janice, and uh, Siobhan. So then, I was able to... Well, you said, you said, Papa D, you want to join a band? He said, how do you, how do you own this? Yeah, how do you be able to do this? Yeah, and you said, well, I'm a... I'm, I'm, a, I'm okay. a machinist, you know. So then, we started, uh, you know, started getting together, and then Howard just came out the military. Howard had gotten drafted, because before he got drafted, we were the creators. And boy, oh boy. We were the first black, one of the first black bands booked on the Sunset Strip. We was opening for Ike and Tina Turner, the Righteous Brothers. You were, you, the you were backing up Deacon Jones, right? Oh, I mean, yeah. that, that was well, the, that, though, that's even before Deacon the, Jones. The creators was just you and, and Howard. Yeah, Howard, uh, George Brown, Bobby Nicholson. Wow, yeah. And, and uh, uh, B.B. was in there for a bit. And then so we was playing these clubs. And then all of a sudden we was working with Bob Eubanks, who was at the, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, uh, CC Center Month Center. He had these clubs. By the way, was coming from his club that day. The Watts Ride broke out and got caught up in the Watts Ride. But anyway, go forward. We was just getting ready to be booked at the Thunderbird Hotel. We're talking roughly about 19, late 65, 66. Right. We were getting ready to be booked at the in Las Vegas, five hundred dollars each a week. Can you imagine? And all that's, of a like, sudden, a, that's like a hundred. That's like a, that's like fifty grand or that was eighty grand today. And then <laughs> and then all of a sudden, Howard got drafted. Bobby Nicholson, he's no longer with us, played trumpet. They got drafted. Howard got drafted to the army. Bobby got drafted. I said, Oh boy! Oh, I had my own first business right here. That was one way I was supporting myself. When Papa D met me outside of being a machinist. I had my auto detail shop, body and fender. But anyway, he got drafted. I said, oh boy, what am I gonna do? So then at that point, my business, personal business here in Long Beach took a dive. I went back to being a machinist. That's when I started working night shifts and stuff. Making money, I had, to, I had kids, I had to support them. I didn't dodge the draft. I did go take the test, you know, for the draft. I mean, for the, uh, uh, Marine Corps back in June of 64, but I didn't go back to get sworn in because I started my own business. Then when the draft came along, they didn't draft me because I had my two boys and they left me alone. And then I started working doing special projects, you know, for the military and the federal government. So then Howard finally came on back out. We're roughly about 1968 or so, middle of 68. And that's about the time I had met Papa D. And then Papa D, I said, let's put a band, let's try it one more time, Howard. If we don't make it this time, Booker T. Washington, Up From Slavery, that book right there, he says, he built two, he was one of the ones that built Tuskegee University. And he said, they tried to make their own bricks. Mm. He started making bricks, it didn't work. They tried the second time, it didn't work. The third time, it didn't work. And then he went and pawned his watch in Atlanta, Georgia. And the fourth time they made bricks, they succeeded. <laughs> right. So I learned not to give up. So that's what you can't do out there. Don't give up. Because that's why I was one of the best distance runners in the state of California. Because I don't give up. Most people, just when they give up, give up, that's when you can, you can make it. You can make it. That second win, we call it. So anyway, Howard came on back. I had gotten down and says, well, they always say don't burn your bridges. Well, if you read 
the art of war, Sun Tzu, he said, there's certain times you do burn your bridge. If you want your troops to march forward, burn that bridge, because if you want to go home, you got to go that way. That's right. That's <laughs> so you're damn right. Yeah. So what I did, I was working. I told Howard, I said, let's try one more time. That's when him and I came with the idea, we're going to name the group Night Shift. So what I did, I went and sold off all my machinist tools. So if things got rough, I couldn't go that way. I went and bought me a set of drums from Spiegel's catalog. I bought my first Pearl drums. I paid $199 for those drums. And I said, okay, let's go. So I started playing, you know, I started, uh, uh, you know, we started going out playing shows and stuff. And then I got down, you know, low on cash. I think I was down to my last $7. I knew they couldn't kick us out of our home there in Pomona. <laughs> I knew they couldn't. And, and it took a year to kick us out, to foreclose on us. So I was getting down to that point. I was down to my last $7. Gas cost about 28 cents a gallon, then 23 cents. And my kids were at home. Doe, Ray, Daryl, Janice. And I said, oh, boy. I'm gonna to have to find a job. So go out and uh, uh, go out there at uh, North Hollywood, Thousand Oaks somewhere, off of uh, Hollywood, you know, freeway. I get there, and it's before they had affirmative action. I get there, and it's for like a thrifty drugstore chain. I think that the, you know maybe I'll become a, mm, you know, a man manager or something. They looked at me and they seen me. Mm, you need to go down there down by Dorsey, Crenshaw area. So I go down, I'm coming down the hill on highway, the Hollywood freeway, I get by sunset, and I had to use the bathroom, take a wee wee. And I started thinking about my buddy, Marshall Lieb. Marshall Lieb, Lieb's guy. For you who don't know him, look him up. Marshall Lieb, he's the producer for What the World Needs Now, is Love, Sweet Love, Jackie DeShannon. And then I used to go in the studio and do overdubs for him. Because there was one song like last night. Well, the drummer couldn't do those roles. He'd have me do the roles. So I got down, I was right there, and I said, I'm not going to give up yet. And that was a fate. That's when the Holy Spirit, that's when... God put me on a different track. <laughs> I went down, and I remember he was working at Liberty Records across from Hollywood High. And it was Liberty Records there. It's not there anymore, but Hollywood High is still there. Sun's Liberty Sunset, yeah. Yep, you yep. know where I'm at. So I go there, and they let me use the restroom, and I was looking for Marshall. Is Marshall leave here? No, he's not here. He says, bro, well, why don't you uh, 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 go down I'll go down to Jim Air Production. He's down there at the 9,000 building. Jim Air Production. It's set right there on Doheny and Sunset in that big, top, big tall building. Well, I go down there and I go up in there. At that time, all the secretaries and stuff had those hairdos that looked like Lucille Ball. There's the Arnaz. So I go in there and, <coughs> excuse me. I go in there and she says, uh, uh, Harold, uh, 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 Brown, he's not here, but I can show you where he's at. We went and looked out the window. And she said, you see over there? That little white house. I go in this little white house. He had married Frankie Lane's daughter. Mule train, giddy up, ha! I walked in there and there was another lady looked like Lucille Ball. I could see all the gold records up there. That's when I realized he married Frankie Lane. And they had race horses and stuff. And I could hear him in the back room talking. I go back there in that back room, and so after he said, wait for me, I go outside, I sit there waiting in the lobby. He comes up, come on with me, Harold. We go down on Sunset, there used to be an Art LeBeau studio right there on Sunset, and I think maybe Coanga. Sit there, you know, on there, and got there, went upstairs, they had a recording studio up there. 
I'm there for a few minutes, and all of a sudden the phone rang. Oh, Timmy, oh, you need a drummer? Oh, Timmy, I got one of the best ones in the city. Because now remember Marshall Lee, I didn't know he was one of the founders of Bank of America. I didn't know that. I knew that I was the only one when I had my auto detail shop. I was the only one that could clean his Ferraris. Godfather of hot rods. And he used to showcase his Ferraris at Disneyland and stuff. But anyway, I'm up there and he's saying, Oh, Timmy, oh, you need a drummer? I got one. I'll send him down to you. I said, oh, boy, I'm probably down to about maybe four bucks because gas is 23 cents a gallon and so forth. So then he has me drive on down. I'm going down Sunset toward Beverly Hills going west toward Beverly Hills. I get down to King's Drive and I go north on King's Drive and I'm going up this hill and I get in front of this big mansion with gates. I said, whoa, my luck is changing. I go inside, and here are these guys. It was Timmy Ural, the famous jazz singer. Look her up, Timmy Ural. And then she was there, and these, these other musicians and people were saying, well, you know what we need? Uh, I, well, I need an amplifier. Well, I need drumsticks. Well, we need transportation. And the spirit came to me and says, no, Harold, you're not leaving you guys, Howard Scott, Lonnie Jordan, uh, uh, George Brown, any of those guys from your group, the night shift, to go with these guys? No. I'm going to go back down the hill to Art LeBeau studio where, you know, uh, uh, my boy Marshall Lieb is there. I'm going to go upstairs. I'm going to just tell him, call up Timmy Ural and tell her you got a band. We got everything and we're ready, ready to go, as we say in New Orleans, ready to go. Just when I started to go up the steps, <laughs> this young man is sitting there, R.B. Greaves, before he ever had his first hit. R.B. Greaves is sitting there going, oh, we called him Sonny Childs at the time. They always do that to me. He's just on the stoop right there. Oh, they always do that. I said, man, what's wrong with you? They took my band. They took my band. I said, what? They took your band. And I got these gigs. I said, what? You got gigs, and we got a band. That's why I ran behind there. It was a gas station with a little hamburger stand. I ran back there in the back. I, Mama and them always told them, Mama and them, uh, them, them, told us to keep a dime in your pocket. Now you need a quarter. If you can find a pay phone, you might borrow somebody's right. cell phone. I ran back to I called up Howard. He was living down there in Compton on School Street. He knows he's straight out of Compton. <laughs> I got down there and I, I called up and I said, Howard, guess what? Our luck has changed. We got a gigs with our, you know, Sonny Childs, where he became R.B. Greaves, you know, knock, knocked three times, sent a letter to Maria, that's the big hitty room. And so we get there and then all of a sudden we started rehearsing. Jim Head Productions that was down there in 9,000 building. That's where Deacon Jones came from. Hello. So everybody can't tell you this story because God used me as a spark plug. Get, hold that one second. 